welcome to Green Signals, your No Punches Pulled podcast. Um, from me, Nigel Harris, in a soaking wet Lincolnshire today, and... And from me, Richard Bowker, in possibly the last time um, from Derbyshire. I wasn't going to mention that, so the Derbyshire studio is moving. Uh, it, it is. We're going, as the Americans would say, we're going mobile. Um, no, actually, um, Mrs. bowker has got a fantastic new job. But hey. it's in Wil- it is, yeah, absolutely. But it's in Wiltshire and she needs to be in the office, so we're going to move. Just before Christmas. I do not envy you. Anyway, we'll move <laughs> swiftly. We'll move swiftly on that because if you're moving, you're doubtless short of time, Richard. Um, anyway, look, we've another cracking show for you this week, so thanks for tuning in. Just a quick word. If you're a regular sort of audio listener, then fine, carry on with that. Um, you'll get the usual wonderful experience of the mellifluous tones. That's the word of the podcast this time, Richard. That's Mellif- very good. I like that. That's very good. Mellifluous um, tones of Richard and myself. But um, we've actually sent Richard out this week. He's been out on location as a roving reporter doing some interviews and filming in conjunction with the um, the sad anniversary of the Clapham um, rail accident. So you might just want to take a look on, on, on YouTube because you get rather more to look at this week. Um, than Richard and I sat here jawing about trains. Um, so take your pick or watch both. Well, watch one and listen to the other. Whatever you want to do. You know what I'm saying. Following our interview last week with the measured and inspirational Alex Hines, the managing director of Scotland's Railway, we have the second part of our Scottish adventure, a fascinating and quite lively interview with Bill Reeve, director of rail for Transport Scotland. And it gets a little spicy, doesn't it, Richard? I'm not sure about spicy. I, there was certainly a healthy exchange of views, certainly. Certainly when we got to the borders, railway, yeah. Well, I was expecting that, and I was not disappointed. Excellent. That's the Green Signals approach. Frank exchanges of views, passionately expressed. Um, we discussed the bad news we heard from Paddington last week when a major overhead line incident led to some passengers, well, many of them, being stuck on trains for four hours. Um, and some railway managers pulling their hair out at the railway's seeming collectively inability to manage the situation with any promptness. Um, And Richard reports from Siemens Mobilities HQ in Chippenham, once the home of Westinghouse, where he attended a very special event on December 12th around the Clapham anniversary. Much more of that to come. But first, some reaction to Alex Hines last week. Thanks to Steph for rooting these out. Rare Track Rob said on X, Twitter, This was a jolly good episode. I spent a good t- I spend a good time in the part of the year in Scotland and usually think to myself, this is how it should be, darn saf. And yes, Alex's point about objective alignment is spot on. I can think of many examples from the last decade or so of my railway career. And on YouTube, Richard Barrow said, An excellent and uplifting episode, we thought so too. It is so refreshing to hear a positive story about the railway as part of the wider economy. It really matters where one draws the boundary when looking at the costs and benefits of a railway. The railway isn't a standalone entity. It's a means to an end, the transportation of people and goods. And so say all of us, Richard. And finally, Brian Newton said, Thank you all. Another brilliant episode and a real breath of fresh air to hear such a positive story amongst all the current gloom and doom. If only there was the foresight and will from government and DFT to adopt a similar approach south of the border, Sunak, Harper and Merriman take note. We've said that many times ourselves, Brian, and we'll all keep saying it as often as we can. But first, a special Green Signals feature reflecting on a notorious rail disaster that led to fundamental changes in railway safety management. Richard has more from out on location at Siemens at Chippenham too, as well as his Derbyshire home studio. 35 years ago, on December the 12th, 1988, during the morning rush hour, the driver of a Basingstoke to Waterloo train encountered an incorrect sequence of colour light signals. He brought his train to a halt in accordance with the rule book at the next signal and telephoned the signaller. Unbeknown to him, his train was occupying a faulty track circuit and the signal behind his 12-coach train, which he justifiably assumed was protecting it, was wrongly showing green. 
as he talked to the signaller of following 12 coach pull to Waterloo service past the green signal and hit the stationary Basingstoke train around 60 miles an hour. The wreckage careered into the path of an empty train approaching from the opposite direction, bound for Hazelmere. 35 people lost their lives. A further 69 suffered life-changing injuries. Countless more were injured and scarred, physically and mentally. On December the 12th, 2023, those who lost loved ones and were impacted so terribly by the Clapham Rail disaster met for a service of remembrance and moment of reflection at the Clapham Train Accident Memorial itself in Spencer Park, near to the site of the accident. I've come here to Siemens Mobility's headquarters at Chippenham to attend one of a number of industry events taking place around the country on the anniversary. Organised by Andy Stringer, the chief engineer of Siemens Mobility, the events are designed to look at how the resulting public inquiry really changed UK rail safety management, but how the lessons are just as pertinent today. In the last 35 years, the industry has been privatised, changed dramatically, and is arguably undergoing another period of intense change. There is a risk that corporate memory can be lost, but events like today are designed to show we cannot let that happen. The specific cause of the accident was quickly identified at the time. A wire in a line-side signalling cabinet should have been disconnected two weeks previously. It had been erroneously merely disconnected at one end and so remained live. And instead of being cut short, its loose trailing end was protected only with reused insulation tape. During further works the day before the tragedy, this poorly protected loose live wire was accidentally moved and it made contact across the track circuit relay that should have been protecting trains standing on the track section where the collisions happened the very next day. Siemens have built models of the wiring in place at Clapham on that fateful day to show the engineers of today what went wrong and, crucially, how to avoid such failures in the future. The subsequent inquiry into the Clapham accident, chaired by Anthony Hidden QC, was groundbreaking because instead of attributing blame to the individual who'd made the wiring error, Hidden instead turned the spotlight on an industry which consistently talked about the importance of safety, but had failed to turn those words into meaningful action. In doing so, Hidden highlighted no fewer than 16 areas which were underlying causes. These were issues of culture, leadership, management and audit. It was a watershed moment in transferring both culture and process. I spoke with Greg Morse, Operational Feedback Lead at Railway Safety Standards Board, and author of a detailed book on the accident to discuss the circumstances that led to the accident, what has changed since, and crucially, how the railway industry can mitigate the risk of losing its corporate memory. Well, I'm here with Greg Morse. Um, delighted to, um, uh, to, to spend this time, to, Greg. You're the author of the book, The Clap and Train Accident, Causes, Context and the Corporate Memory Challenge. I should just say, we're, we're sat outside here at Siemens um, because we didn't want to interrupt what was going on in, inside, so hence the reason for the rather <laughs> rural-looking backdrop. Um, in your book, you talk about the external forces that created the environment in which the Clap and Train accident occurred. And it was interesting, not just in the context of British Rail, but obviously the one that was applying on the government as well at the time. And you've just talked about that in the presentation you've just given to the engineers here. Can you just sort of summarise that? I mean, what, what was going on? What were the big things that really led to what happened that day? It was about money. It's usually been about money when uh, we think about British Rail, British Railways. In fact, when, when we were nationalised in 1948, from then on, we've come under greater uh, government scrutiny mm. for finances. So you, you can think of the modernisation plan of 1955. Here's some money, go away and modernise. A few years later, change of regime, change of economic circumstances, you're spending too much, can you retrench? And we've, we've had that kind of boom and slump really since then. In the late 70s, there were a number of factors. There was an oil crisis, which meant a scarcity of oil, but also higher prices. Um, inflation was up heavily as a result. And the new government, Margaret Thatcher's first administration of the time, knew that they wanted to cut inflation couldn't do anything about the oil crisis, 
couldn't really do anything about uh, a tax rise because they'd come in on a ticket that they wouldn't raise yeah, taxes. They would do that, sure. The lady wasn't for turning on that particular point, as she famously said at uh, the 1980 conference, I think. So we go for the public sector obligation payments. Now, that sounds like a long way off from Clapham, but it set the scene, really, because the Waterloo Area Resignaling Scheme was first mooted in 1978, and it was really down to that need to cut costs to shape any project that would have to go before the Transport Secretary for approval, as wars would have had to have done. That's really why it took so long right. to, to get to the OK, which came in the mid in the mid 80s so about 5 years after it was first mooted the project had become rather more urgent to remodel the track and renew the signalling and the wiring much of which dated back to the 1930s at that point so we have that on the one side so the the need to cut costs at the same time, strangely, it's almost the opposite effect. So by the mid to late 80s, the economy was in a greater position, largely thanks to North Sea oil. Mm. Funds were greater. That led to a lot more people across society having a lot more money. When you add that to the burgeoning telecommunications industry, what we then have is a situation where a lot of signalling technicians and, and managers in, in that space thought, well, I'd like a better standard of living. I'm going to jump to a different industry. I'm going to jump to that industry that's now available to me with better pay and working conditions. But the resignalling scheme, the plan for it, kept going at the same pace as when, as when British Rail had enough staff. Yeah. That meant the, the, the opportunity, rather, not obligation, the opportunity to self-select self for overtime was there in abundance. Mm. And even now, one hears the phrase in mess rooms occasionally, do you want to pay your mortgage or do you want to rest? So that's why the technician really worked one day with a, uh, in 13 weeks, uh, really worked 13 yeah. weeks with one day off because he was able to and nobody was checking him. And as, of course, he told the inquiry, he felt OK. We didn't understand fatigue in those days yes. and, and what it meant as a, as a sort of a cumulative effect. So it's, it sounds like we had the perfect storm. We had um, a, a project that had been delayed, 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 but when it got approved, it had to be done in just the same, you know, there was they were under huge pressure to get it done. Um, and at the same time, we were losing people out of the industry who had the experience to do the jobs. That's right. But then when the hidden inquiry almost went beyond that and said it wasn't just about that particular project or the circumstances around that project, there was a wider cultural issue here that exposed, because it's quite unusual, the hidden inquiry didn't sort of pin the blame on a person, it blamed it on a system and a method of working an entire culture, didn't it? It did, it did. And a lot of people in British Rail further up at the time assumed they were safe. They felt they had a good safety culture. A lot of figures were coming down. And yeah. SPADs, signals past danger incidents, were seen as the big problem. And the two SPAD and uh, uh, collisions that occurred very quickly after each other in March 1989, which Hidden also looked at, showed that British Rail was probably right to look at SPADs, mm. but you have to take the wider view. Unfortunately, wrong side failures were a very much hidden pocket of risk. Now, when a, when a signal shows a proceed aspect when it should be a stop aspect, that's, that's a wrong side failure. But it was in a big pot of wrong side failures with right. things like a broken level crossing gates. And nobody was sort of diving in and reanalyzing those incidents because they would have spotted a number of data points starting to form with signalling errors, failures of testing that were starting to bubble under in the run-up to Clapham. But it was ironically hidden from view. Yeah. So yes, the feeling was we have a good safety culture, our people know what safety means, and of course a lot of them did. Nobody deliberately did anything unsafe. Sure. They were working to what they thought was right be it with that overlay of fatigue on them, the pressures to get the job done, because we said we would, so we will. So what happened after Hidden? Did, did the industry go, or we have got to be, we've got to address this. Did, did we get a change in the immediate aftermath of, of the accident and the report? We did. A huge amount of work was done culturally. British Rail is rather ironically a little bit like automatic warning system, just starting trials as the Harrow and Wilston spad and collision occurred. That BR, was in 1952, right? BR was already going down this path to improve its safety culture. It was a bit of a buzz phrase of the time, sure. but it was doing this work. 
and it really tightened up its safety arm. So although splitting into sectors might look now like a bad idea, post Clapham, it really sort of enveloped all of these sectors under a safety and standards director. I think Terry Gorvish in his second book on British Rail talks about this yeah. eloquently, about how very clear chains of command for safety were brought in because of that. And of course there were other things as well. The fatigue question started to be addressed and we've taken that forward in the post-privatisation industry, of course. Um, the rolling stock issue, all of the trains involved were Mark 1s. Now, there were other accidents, of course, that came after, including Cannon Street in 1991, where Mark 1s and even older stock were involved that demonstrated a lack of crashworthiness. Cool. It's interesting to note that back in Harrow, there were two Mark 1s, I think, involved at that event. They were, at the time, in the early 50s, lauded for their superior crashworthiness over the pre-nationalisation vehicles. But by the late 80s, they were very much a poor relation to the Mark 3s. What I've never been able to ascertain, though, is could one of the trains at Clapham have been a Class 442, a Wessex Electric Mark 3 based superior crashworthy stock? Mm. They were just coming in, and a unit was put out of action by striking, a, I think, a cement mixer that had been put on the line the day before. I think, I, I like to think, would like to know if one of the trains at Clapham had been a Mark 3 design would the death toll have been less? The college accident suggested that that might have been the case because only one person was killed in that and he was the driver, I think, at the, at the front of the train. Mm -hmm. So rolling start was improved, safety culture was improved, the way we look at fatigue was improved. Yeah. A number of different elements went on to be improved and then we were privatised. Yeah. And I think one of the other lessons of Clapham is the management of change. That was a huge change. Yeah. One could argue, it's possibly safer to say it's a moot point, that privatisation was in the causal chains of Southall, Labrook, Grove, Hatfield. I think they are. But I think as Clapham demonstrated, management of change is an issue whatever stage you're at in your organisation. And I don't think it's limited to the railway by any means either. No. Oh, now, just bring it to the, the current day, um, the, the, the events just hearing from um, a couple of uh, young single engineers who are um, just beginning their career. And it's fantastic to see um, uh, that happening, but um, slightly sort of salutary lesson, certainly for some of us that, that you know, they weren't even uh, around at the time, weren't alive at the time of, uh, of Clapham in mm -hmm. 1988. So it's not even a fading memory. It's not really a memory at all, which is why these events are so important. But there is a bit of a concern, isn't there? Because there have been some recent events, relatively recent events we talk about, and perhaps you can just mention a couple of those, where echoes of what happened have appeared again. How, how concerning is that, do you think, and what do we do about it? I think it is concerning. Um, the presentation I gave earlier today mentions uh, Cardiff East and Waterloo, which were yeah. alongside signalling failures, failures of testing as well, which the Rail Accident Investigation Branch investigated. Since then, of course, as you, you rightly say, we've had a couple more mm. at Dalwini in Scotland and South Wingfield. I think South Wingfield is, is very pertinent because in that particular case, the signalling maintenance testing handbook that had come out of the Clapham accident with IRSE accreditation attached to it wasn't being followed. And the reason it wasn't being followed was that Network Rail had briefed that out, rebriefed that out to its own staff, but not its contractors. So there was a missing element there. Um, the Dalwini accident is also of interest because there's a slightly wider point there that the, the tester who missed the wiring error, which led the points to um, send an HST off the rails, was suffering from long COVID. Now he had issues which his, his manager knew about, mm. but he, rather like the technician uh, the Clapham inquiry said he felt fine. Yeah, he didn't. He wasn't aware. Just as the technician at Clapham wasn't aware that fatigue, the cumulative effects of fatigue, would impact mm. on performance. The tester at Dal Winnie wasn't aware that long COVID would impact on performance. So if we talk about Clapham and change management, it could be that the nature of fatigue itself is starting to change in this post-COVID era, and we need to factor that into our wider industry Absolutely, thinking. Yeah. What? Is the industry doing now I mean, in your own area of RSSB to ensure that the corporate memory uh, of of Clapham and the and what changed the result is not forgotten? When we started 
realising that a lot of stories were being lost. I mean, when I joined RSSB, I was given a copy of Red for Danger by Rolt, and I still recommend that. It's uh, a great book. It's a great book. Yeah. It's, it's a very human book, and I think that's yeah. really important. I still recommend that when I go about to companies telling stories of old accidents yeah. like, like Clapham. But I think more pertinently, as an organisation, RSSP is now starting to feature these incidents and the lessons from them into more and more of its products and services. So the Red Series of Briefing DVDs that we produce for, for frontline staff principally, but I think they're useful for all grades of staff, to be honest. We've started including corporate memory material in that as well. Brilliant. We've started to include it in the, we call them risk packs. They're, they're safety performance and risk um, analyses packs, really, that we present to the cross-industry groups. Every sector of the industry has its own cross-industry right. group where people get around the table or on teams now and talk about recent safety performance and risk. Well, if an incident has occurred that uh, rings a bell with a previous incident, we tend to feature that in the paper and the presentation now. So we remind people in the room. And also, I think even better than that in terms of granularity, the people who monitor safety risk and performance using our safety risk model, which was developed as a result of Clapham, incidentally. They are now adding corporate memory information into that process so that new mathematicians who come along realize why things are the way they are. I think that's the importance of corporate memory. It's understanding why things are done the way they're done and all our ways and presumably all other industries. It will be for a reason. And certainly with our industry, this is why the rule book is so big. It started with an accident happens, we write a rule to stop it, <laughs> and, and so on and so on. It's a continuation of that yeah. process, really. Yeah. Well, it's vital we remember, it's vital we continue to learn. So, Greg Morse, thank you so much for attending this today and giving a fantastic presentation, which I was lucky to hear, but also spending time talking to us now. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So what about the young railway engineers of today? Too young to remember Clapham but now embarking on careers in an exciting industry such as the railways, but one where an understanding of the safety critical nature of everything they do is more important than ever before. I spoke with Katie Plenty and Ben Avis, degree apprentices in rail systems at Siemens Mobility, about the lessons they had learned in the day's events. Well, I'm joined here by uh, Ben and Katie, who are degree Apprentices, is that correct? Yes. And so just starting out on your careers. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's begin with you, Katie. I mean, you've, you've seen uh, this today, you've seen the circuit, you've heard what happened. Um, how do you think that is going to be relevant to what you're going to do? And then, you know, what, what learnings have you got for as you start to think about the, developing your career as, as an engineer? Well, I think it's um, where you see the mistakes that was made in the industry and to recognise that... Uh, to not be overworked, so if people continuously ask you to, can you work this shift, can you work this shift, then you're on your right to say, I need a rest day, uh, because that's what the mistake happened, is because he was overworked, he worked 90 days in a row. Yeah. So um, I think it's yeah, quite important just to stand your ground at some points, and if you feel something's unsafe or something's being done the wrong way, it's yeah. important to speak up and challenge it. Absolutely. And Ben, when you think about sort of safety on the railways as a whole, you yes. know, where it, it, we often say it's it's about a culture, it's about it's about sort of top to bottom. What does what does safety on the railway mean to you? Um, so I think it's about, you know, as you've heard a lot today, it's about everyone getting home safely, so they're protecting the workers, and but then also the work that you're doing, you're doing it in a safe way to protect the people that. Um, are going to use, you know, what you're creating or installing or testing. People is going to use it, and people's lives are at risk. So, you know, it's a real life you know, safety issue, and it needs to be thought about every day. I think. Absolutely, that's the key, isn't it? Every yeah. day. Well, look, it's fantastic. It's it's great to see, you know, young managers coming through into the railway industry and as and as focused on safety as as we always need to be. So, Ben, Katie, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I spoke with Nick Dunn, Director of Technology at Siemens Mobility, about what he felt the benefits of the day had been and what they'd brought to his team as they looked to help design and plan the railway of the future. Well, I'm 
Delighted to uh, be joined here by Nick Dunn, Director of Technology for Siemens Mobility. Nick, Nick thanks for uh, inviting us. It's letting us see this incredible event. What what for you has this all been about? Why why was this such an important thing to do in this industry and as a business? We really struggle with corporate memory. Yeah. Um, even down to our, our simple safety alerts and all the various things we have going on. And so um, it seems a great opportunity to um, highlight through obviously reflecting on what was a major disaster for the industry, but a huge changing point. And it's still so relevant today. So all the various learnings, as, as I said um, when I talked to the audience earlier, you know, our four steps, first step, be fit for work. That's all about fatigue, competency, um, state of mind. Uh, we heard from Richard Brown earlier about non-technical skills, about you know how people not only are technically in the right place when they go to work, but also around turning up for work and mentally um, fit and, and understanding their roles and responsibilities and the criticality of their role in the right industry. So, but equally, what's really important is, our, you know, our, we, we brought in a huge number of new people into the industry over the last 10, 15 years. Um, so for them to get an understanding of uh, the importance of an event like Clapham and how it impacts on them and their roles is, is so critical, I think, to, to get in their mindset and get them to understand, you know, what they do is fundamental. It's fundamental. And what was terrific about the, the, the session today the, the quality of the questions was superb, I thought. I mean, they were really, really good, you know, smart, intelligent in, in questions. Um, and to hear from two of your very young, if I can say that, um, signaling engineers uh, who were just sort of starting out in their careers, who weren't even around at the time of the disaster we're talking about, um, so important for them. You clearly place a great deal of emphasis on on training and bringing forward the next sort of generation. How do, do you have a sort of full program in place, or are events like these just part and parcel of that training? No, obviously we 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 try to build in from the minute they arrive here. And I think you heard from from Katie and Ben around, you know, their their project induction and the training they're given when they first arrive around how we try and set that safety culture right from the minute they walk in the door and join the organisation. Um, it was fascinating to hear from Katie about her preconceptions around safety and and the rail industry um, and how that then became reality when she starts to actually work for us. But but that whole piece around, I think one of our challenges is always around young and old. We want that experience, but we also don't want that this is the way we've always done it. So trying to get our younger people to be the voice of, this is the way we're told, told how to do it. These are the procedures we're meant to follow. This is what's expected of us. Getting them into that mindset, yeah. having them part of that blend of old and new experience and youth is, is we, we certainly found it's, it's massively beneficial. Yeah. But look, Seagulls of Ability take a real lead on this. Uh, at this particular event, I mean, it is terrific to see what's what would be your kind of one message, I suppose, to the whole rail industry um, in the light of you know what what we've seen today, what we've learned. What what's the single message that comes out of this? I think trying to get one single message is difficult. Clearly, um, everything that's gone on and being developed and the huge amount of effort that's been put in has been put in for a very good reason. So absolutely, Martin Frobisher reaffirming earlier, follow your procedures, follow your processes, use all the competencies, the licensing, all of that training and learning that we've had over the years and, and has come from these painful events, it's there for a reason. And, and live by that reason. Use that as a, as a stimulator for, for, for sticking to what, what you've been told to do, how you to do it. Is, is absolutely critical. I think the other thing is for me, it's, it's the whole industry learning point is really important. We do, we are competitive by nature. We are, you know, we're taught to, we, we talk to promote our businesses and market, etc. But at the end of the day, there is no boundaries when safety is, is concerned. Um, anything that happens in the industry that harms our industry has to harm us corporately as a business. So 
doing it as one, which we tried to do today, and coming together to say it's really important for everybody is 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 a key a key thing for us that we all, as as I said, you know, pain with pride, um, learn with pain, share with pain. That's that's important. That's a really powerful message. Nick really Dunn, thanks very much. Thank you. Well, hats off um, to Siemens and to uh, the Railway Safety Standards Board, the Railway Accident Investigation uh, Branch and to Network Rail for uh, putting on this event, not just here in Chippenham, but around the country, I know as well uh, at Clapham. Um, it has been a thought provoking, a challenging and a really engaging um, uh, day. And uh, certainly I've learned a great deal. I think with Clapham, we always begin by remembering uh, the 35 people who lost their lives and of course the many that were seriously injured and, um, and affected for a long, long time. And, but it is also important that we learn from events and we put those into practice, that learning, and we never allow our corporate memory to diminish. In fact, on that, I'm really reminded of what Anthony Hidden said in his uh, report. He said, the evidence therefore showed the sincerity of the concern for safety Sadly, however, it also showed the reality of the failure to carry that concern through into action. It has to be said that a concern for safety, which is sincerely held and repeatedly expressed, but nevertheless is not carried through into action, is as much a protection from danger as no concern at all. Events like today and remembering events of 35 years ago Reminders we can never forget those words uh, and the sentiments they express. The price of safety is eternal vigilance. Always has been and it always must be. A really great package there from Richard with some top notch interviews and of course some very sober lessons which need to be held very much in mind. As one or two very senior railwaymen have said to me, uh, most railway managers working in the industry now have not lived through or work through a big railway mishap. And of course, the last time we had one, there was no real social media. God forbid it happens again, there'll be absolute mayhem. So management needs to be ready. And do you know, do you know something on that, Nigel? One of the big takeaways from me from that visit to Siemens was a presentation by uh, Richard Brown from RAIB, who went through a number of the incidents that have taken place in the last few years. We had Cardiff, South Wingfield, Galwini, um, and, uh, it was on the Waterloo in 2017. And I was struck because he said, in slightly different circumstances, any one of those could have been far worse. And all of them had echoes of Clapham. So that mm. kind of constant vigilance and never losing corporate memory, as you've just you know, alluded to, absolutely vital. Eternal vigilance is a very powerful expression and it needs to be held absolutely, mm. absolutely in mind. So don't forget to let us know what you think. Now, last week on the show, we were delighted to chat to Alex Hines, Managing Director of Scotland's Railway, who talked so passionately and positively, though with a firm grip on hard-nosed delivery, about what it takes today to run a successful integrated railway. So today, we go a bit further up the chain, and it's a turn of policy leader Bill Reeve, the Director of Rail at Transport Scotland, who gave us a strategic and government perspective from the Scottish administration. Here's what Bill had to say. So our first guest is Bill Reeve, Director of Rail for Transport Scotland, which is in charge of formulating a strategy for and then implementing Holyrood's chosen rail policy. Um, Bill is an old, oh, sorry, Bill, I should say long-standing and valued friend um, and an intriguing railwoman who <laughs> who mixes his training and experience as an engineer and an experienced railwayman with a very shrewd political awareness. It's a compelling mix, which, as I've implied already, plays a key part in giving Scotland a distinctive, successful and forward-looking rail policy, which is something we don't often say south of the border, which the devolved government at Holyrood has implemented with some enthusiasm. There have, of course, been issues, setbacks and some controversy, but they always accompany an assertive and expansionist approach. You cannot make railway omelettes without cracking a few political eggs, can you? We're delighted you've been able to uh, join the show, Bill, at what we know is an especially busy time for you, so thank you for making the time. 
Um, just before we get underway, give us a quick flavor of your CV today, your, your greatest hits, which, of course, included a spell working for Richard at the SRA, which would be one of the greatest hits, I'm absolutely certain. Well, it was, it was a, 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 a uniquely enjoyable experience, Richard. Um, so, so uh, uh, well, uh, look, I was uh, recruited by British Rail um, in 1983. I won a scholarship to go to university, but I started before I went to university uh, on the shop floor in Crew Works, Crew Locomotive Works, building uh, um, uh, where we were building Class 56s when I was there. Um, uh, and uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, which is what uh, the railway recruited me for. Um, my early career was involved in um, rolling stock maintenance at depots like Gateshead and Tisley. Uh, I moved on through um, uh, a sponsored MBA that British Rail gave me. And I think it's really interesting how much effort the, the joined up role put into developing management actually it's quite an important reflection um uh to uh, join the freight business um uh, and through the freight business i was privatized into what became ews uh, i then moved to the strategic rail authority and when the strategic rail authority uh, was to my mind somewhat prematurely brought to an end um uh, I was quite impressed with what the Scottish government was doing in its investment plans for the railway, and I applied for uh, and secured the job to set up the new rail team at the time that rail powers were devolved to uh, the Scottish Parliament in 2005. And um, uh, I have liked that role, and for some curious reason they have liked me, and uh, we are still here, and I have to say it's a fabulous privilege and a fabulous uh, uh, responsibility as well to... Um, uh, to lead the Scottish government's interest in the railway system in Scotland, uh, because we've done some amazing things in that time. That's absolutely brilliant, and um, welcome. Let me add my welcome. It's it's good to see you again, and and uh, they they were terrific times at the SRA, and of course I agree with you about um, it, its premature demise. But you 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 talk there about some of the amazing things that have happened, and and uh, you know, no one can deny that. Um, and, and, and actually, someone you could, you could say Scotland's been a bit of a trendsetter, really. Actually, if you look at the things that have happened, uh, Borders Railway reopening, um, you've now got the Leavenmouth um, line, you've got Shots Line electrification. I know that was done a few years ago now, but you've got the Barhead electrification. We've got a whole stack of um, smaller schemes. You've got new stations um, being reopened, more, more planned. It, it reads incredibly well, but it does raise some interesting questions. Um, I mean, first one, I suppose, how, how does how does rail sit inside the overall um, government policy for transportation? I mean, do you find you're having to compete with other modes? Where, where, just just kind of give us a sense of, 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 of Transport Scotland and the Scottish government's overall strategic aims for rail. Right, well... Um, uh... It's, it's one of the pleasures about working in Scotland and, and working in Transport Scotland is, of course, we are a joined up transport agency. So uh, we are responsible. We are the highways agency for Scotland. Uh, we are, uh, in other words, we own the trunk roads. Um, uh, we fund, uh, provide substantial funding for bus services. We own ferries and, uh, and, and, and some ports. We own, indeed, some, some, some airports uh, and even a couple of aircraft. Um, if you fly to Barra and land on the beach, you'll be on a Transport Scotland plane. Oh, really? Um, indeed so. So this is all about, you know, this is about lifeline connectivity for communities and supporting their industries and their, their commerce. And importantly, of course, uh, one thinks of tourism, but don't forget it's also how people from the islands get to the hospital in, in an emergency. So all of this stuff is really uh, fundamental to the operation of a successful economy um, and for the success of the society. So so we do, Richard, absolutely take our decisions in a, in a joined up manner. Um, uh, and for example, no one is happier with our success with rail freight than my colleagues responsible for maintaining our trunk roads, because the more 44 ton HGVs we get off the A9, for example, um, uh, the better the road is for other users and the lower the maintenance costs. So we have those conversations and we do that thinking. Um, and the simple answer is rail does extraordinarily well um, in terms of the budget we secure within that overall transport mix. Um, uh, rail is is arguably the best funded mode, which says we need to do more actually about the efficiency with which we deliver it. And we need to be getting 
higher revenue from the um, uh, from 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 the passengers and indeed the freight customers we are uh, we are working for. So, um, and you asked, I think, about uh, strategic direction where rail sits within that. that. Again, is one of the pleasures of working in Scotland. So, the Scottish government has a stated purpose, and I might summarise it as promoting sustainable and inclusive economic growth for communities throughout Scotland. And um, and so we have a national transport strategy. In fact, uh, we published the second edition of that just a couple of years ago. And that's our guiding light for all of our transport decisions. That links to that Scottish government purpose. Um, and its four key strategic objectives are reducing inequalities, taking climate action, helping deliver inclusive economic growth, and improving our health and well-being. Now, if you just think about those four strategic objectives, rail has a really strong contribution to make to all of those. You mentioned there about sort of funding as well. I would just put my accountant's hat on for a minute. Um, I, it, there'll be people sort of listening to this, uh, you know, maybe from south of the border, let's say, going, that sounds amazing. Um, yeah, it does. Who, but, who's, but who's paying for that, right? How does that get funded? Because it's not an unreasonable question. So, well, if, if they can do it, why can't? Why can't we do it? Are you have is the government having to make choices because it's choosing to put that much money into transport, and particularly into rail? Absolutely, yes. I mean, we have that. We're having those discussions now in the preparation for for the Scottish government's budget. You know, and there are properly questions about how much money is spent on the health service, on education, on policing, and transport. And then within transport, there are properly questions about. Uh, how much money is spent on bus and rail and road and, uh, you know, and importantly, maintaining, for example, the trunk road network, which is a, a key responsibility of ours. So, so yes, absolutely, those discussions are had. But rail comes out consistently very well in those discussions. You mentioned the Borders Project. The Borders Project, interestingly, when I was working for you at the SRA, I cancelled it. Um, and I did that because in pure railway economic terms, it didn't look like a good financial prospect. Uh, but I was delighted to be able to sponsor it through the Parliament here in, in Scotland. Um, why? Because here it's not a railway financial project. It's a project which connected um, Edinburgh, which is the highest gross value added per capita uh, region of, of Scotland, uh, with the borders, which was, I think, third from the bottom of the table in terms of uh, gross value added per capita regions in Scotland. So what this is doing is it's connecting a community with opportunities for employment, education, healthcare, leisure, family connections, all of those things. And it's giving them a real okay, sustainable but, choice. Let, let, let's just unpack that a little bit, if I may, because um, I think to say, um, you know, financial case is 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 a touch misleading, right? Because I remember I remember that discussion very very mm -hmm. well. I think you and I um, had that discussion at the time, and I fully supported. I was very I was I mm -hmm. agreed completely with uh, not progressing with it. And that, by the way, was when it cost 150 million or 180 million or whatever mm -hmm. MPV, not 350 million. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much. It was it wasn't just a financial case. You know, the the economic appraisal for that project, as it is for ev every others, is is based on consumer surplus and value of time. And the, the, the I mean, I think the, the technology of appraisals moved on a bit now. We can take account perhaps more of wider economic benefits. Um, mm -hmm. But surely still with, with the Borders Railway and probably with the others, you, you did basically say the socioeconomic case on our existing appraisal framework doesn't quite stack up, but we're going to do it anyway for the reasons you say. So it's not just that it didn't get cancelled. If anybody's listening, it didn't get cancelled because not it was not financially supported. It was because it didn't meet the economic appraisal criteria at that time. Well, but but that's just taking a narrow view of, of an of economic appraisal. And, and yes, we can use the Treasury Greenbrook model. And I think it produced a BCR for the Borders Railway about 0 0.7, something of that order. Um, uh, but but in Scotland, we use the Scottish Transport Appraisal Guidance, STAG, or STAG 2, again, we've refreshed it. Um, and that helps us to pick projects that relate to those strategic objectives. That's the real importance of having a clear strategic set of priorities and a sense of purpose and an understanding of what your transport is for. So, um, and, and, and it really, you know, the, 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 the Treasury Green Book appraisal is useful 
is useful for the guidance of the wise, but it's for the strict observance of fools because it only tells part of the story. It doesn't, for example, tell you, it doesn't include anywhere, for example, what happens to property values when a, when a railway uh, enters a railway. That's not included in the calculation. It's predicated upon forecasting techniques for demand, which I think to use a technical economic forecasting term might best be considered wrong. Um, I've never opened a railway in Scotland yet where, they, where the forecast demand has actually turned out to be what was what was predicted. And, and if we had followed the economic forecasting, we wouldn't have built a, a station at Stow, which now is the third busiest station on the route. So, so you just and in fact, it it grossly under forecasts the demand from the southern end of the route, which had we followed in strict terms the business case, we'd only have bothered to build the railway into Midlothian. So, so, uh, and and then again, how you value things, you talked about the value of time. That's all based on stated preference services uh, uh, surveys, um, all of which, to be candid, belong to a previous age now, don't they? I mean, travel behaviours, how we value time, what we do when we're travelling, all of that has changed. So um, they they are really useful tools, um, and and yeah. so if I, if no, I, 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 uh, I do think that's I do think that's fair. I do think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so if Nigel. I just if it, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, sorry, buzz out before we. I'm, I, I, I'm smiling here because all three of our previous lives are overlapping here. Yeah. Uh, that was a very elegant and very polite. Um, exchange of views by people at different ends of the spectrum because I remember talking to the pair of you about the Borders project independently and privately when I, when I was editing Rail um, and I remember a p- couple of particularly lively exchanges with you Richard from which I should just say it was fairly obvious you were not a fan of the Borders project <laughs> um, whereas when I've talked to Bill about it he's He's always been very specific in describing it as not a railway reopening in economic terms. It's, it's a tool for the development of the borders in economic and social terms, which is that whole business about whether you capture it, what you're capturing the value of and the weight that it's given is is fascinating. It is fascinating. Uh, just just on that, though, um, briefly, I, I, I've changed my view. I've changed my position, have you? right? Yeah, oh, I have right, changed okay. my position. Um, I'm not saying I would still do the Borders Railway, by the way, but I have changed... Because <laughs> I think we already have. <laughs> Bill made there... No, I think the point you made there, Bill, about um, taking account wider community objects and wider yeah. policy objectives is absolutely fair. My, my only issue has always been um, with anybody who wanted to promote a railway project, they always say, oh, because it's strategic, right? And when you go, what does that mean? They don't actually know. They just think it's a good idea. Nobody should spend public money just because you think something's a good idea. Absolutely right. If you right. do what Bill has described, if you do what Bill has described and say, I don't want to use that old framework. I, I want to use part of it, but I've got this new framework with these new stated objectives and this new policy, and we're going to use that to decide to, whether to do something or don't do something, that I have no issue with. It's just the, oh, I just think it's a good idea. That's the bit I have a problem with. Yeah, well, I, 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 there As you've made clear many times, agreement. Richard, and made, it, <laughs> <laughs> and made it very clear. I'm really, I'm really enjoying this. I am, I have to say. Oh, it's so, great. Um, and, and without blowing, t- what's that expression that the Americans use? Without blowing too much sunshine up your ass, Bill, um, you know, I'm sure yes, another there's reason. There's probably a reason why we don't use that Scotland. expression, isn't there, Nigel? But there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Scotland's railways. Scotland's railways does well because it's got you advocating for them at Holyrood. You yeah. know, and and I think you know um, the number of times I have thought, God, I wish Bill was at the DFT. So, in terms of the future, Bill, what comes next? Uh, rail reopenings, borders, and uh, Labour mouth, do they really make economic sense? I think you've, you've answered that one. Um, what's the long-term impact of your electrification strategy? Um, how much are you impacted? And do you have a view on HS2, for example? Gosh, well, there's a lot in, there's a lot in, in, in just that. I'm just, I'm, uh, right, uh, let's start with the future. So, so the immediate future, we're about to start electric services to Barhead. Um, uh, next, uh, yes, uh, uh, shortly, we'll be opening another station at East Linton to give people in the growing communities along the A1 and East Coast Mainline Corridor a sustainable transport choice into Edinburgh and indeed beyond. Um, and next year, we get to reopen the railway to Levenmouth. And I'll just, I'll just give you one nugget because we, we, we do something called the case for change. 
Richard, picking up on the earlier point about when considering why we might invest somewhere. And one of the things that stuck in my mind uh, from reading that case for change, which is a proper economic analysis of the, of the, of the conditions of the communities in Leven and, and Methil and Cameron Bridge, children coming out of schools in that community are substantially less likely to go on to university or college, even though there's great education facilities, higher education facilities in Dunfermline, in Edinburgh and elsewhere. Why? They can't get there. Mm. They can't get there in a reasonable time. They're not very far away from Edinburgh or Dunfermline, but the bus service takes too long. They don't have access to a car. They can't get there. So if you want to know, I, I, I'm passionate about getting that railway delivered for a whole host of reasons, but one of them is, oh, I don't want another year of children coming out of school not getting access to those life opportunities. So, so that's quite personal, actually, but I think it's Absolutely. really powerful. I hope that, that makes makes some sense. So, so turning it to... Does make, it does make perfect sense. So turning to... Um, uh, well, electrification, I think, was next up. HS2, and oh, crikey, how long have you got? Hmm. Um, but... Uh, but turning to, 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 turning to electrification, um, as you know, uh, we spell decarbonisation with an E in Scotland um, for electrification. Um, but why? Well, um, uh, for a whole host of reasons. Um, uh, right, the big figures for decarbonisation, transport comprises something like 37% of all emissions in Scotland. Um, and it's remained stubbornly high. So, you know, even in, in my time in Scotland, we've done amazing things to reduce the emissions from power generation. Uh, uh, and there's progress in lots of bits of the sector, but two bits of the economy remain stubbornly uh, uh, high emitters. Uh, one is agriculture, but frankly, I don't know how to stop cows belching, so that's not my job. Uh, the other is, um, uh, is the uh, transport. Now, of that 37%, just a few few headline figures, 40% of those emissions are coming from the private car, 25% are coming from heavy goods vehicles and light vans, and vans is a growing bit of that, by the way, um, and about 15% from aviation and 15% from shipping, interestingly, which is surprisingly polluting um, uh, in some cases. Um, but rail is only 1.2% of that 37%. So... So even with our mix of diesel and electrics uh, at the minute, rail is still only 1.2% of all of those 37% of the total emissions in Scotland. So uh, you might say, uh, well, in that case, it's not the biggest problem. And why invest in decarbonising rail? And we should actually be decarbonising the other modes. But the point is our own modelling, our own analysis says we can't get to our targets for, uh, for uh, emission reduction and increasingly importantly, I think also clean air in cities. That's another another aspect of this, without significant modal shift. So then you come back to the question about well, how can we afford significant modal shift? And you know, we invest in electrification. Yes, it reduces emissions, and that's particularly important in terms of the clean air point I just just mentioned. Um, but more than that, an electric railway costs less to operate. Um, uh, attracts more passengers, uh, gets us more capacity out of the existing railway than uh, than the diesel operation does, is more reliable. Um, so what's not to like? And actually, in the conversation I've having with my colleagues, and budgets are incredibly tight. I've never known them to be tighter, in truth, than at the moment. Um, but uh, in those conversations, we're saying we can't afford not to invest in electrification over time because yeah. we can't afford to decarbonize our railway unless we do. And when I look at the relative costs of different technologies, and I, I wish I actually had to hand a slide I shared with some young engineers in, in Sheffield only yesterday, um, uh, you know, diesels are, more, are significantly more expensive than electric trains. Battery electrics are somewhere between the two, but give you a useful, a useful stepping stone. Um, hydrogen trains, and we've done a lot of work on, on hydrogen trains, they can be made to work, um, but they are uh, almost 80% more expensive than diesel. And, and that's down to basic physics. That's not just learning curve stuff. That's actually down to the basic physics of, of you know, how much hydrogen you've got to carry around and so forth. So, so if we want to decarbonize our railway or if we want to run more trains on our railways, um, we can't afford not to electrify. Now, we, we have to phase that, that capital program 
over time um and and we we almost certainly won't be able to do it as quickly as we would like to do it but it's back to that strategic objectives and the guiding lights that gives you so so what's our priority in for the future our priority is actually exactly that um nigel and, and richard it is that that the big strategic priority for rail is a rolling program of electrification that allows us to move over time uh, to a lower cost, higher performing, higher capacity railway, um, uh, because that takes you to financial sustainability as well as environmental sustainability. That sounds brilliant, Billy. If only we were hearing the same from the uh, from the DFT. I am not I'm my sure brother's Richard's keeper, Nigel. His teeth a bit like I'm. Indeed, and I'm not sure it's cows belching of the problem, but we'll not get into that. Um, just before we go, one last question, which I know Richard will roll his eyes at. Um, <laughs> I, I know what it's going to be. Have you got any eyes on any? <laughs> have you got any eyes on any other reopenings? You went on from borders to leave and mouth. Is there another target in mind for the hat trick? Uh, no, I think the focus. Uh, the fact, we've we've opened, reopened more than three in my time here. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, so. Um, uh, but uh, no, um, that's back to what I just said. Uh, our priority now okay. is getting more out of the network we've got with a with a clear focus on electrification. Well, look, thanks for that, Bill. It's fascinating stuff. As you, as you know, there's lots more we could talk about, and I hope you'll come back on the show at some point, um, and we can uh, we can have another session because it's it's an ongoing thing. Um, we really appreciate your time. Um, you and I share a love of uh, real ale and railway history, of course, mm-hmm. and we've indulged both many times in the past. Sometimes at the same time, um, which is which is always fun. And I'm really looking forward to more of that in the future. But meanwhile. Have a great day. Thank you for your time, and um, we'll talk to you again soon. Very Thanks, good. Bill. On Thursday, the 7th of December, a major incident involving a Great Western train in which overhead wiring was damaged led to a three- to four-hour incident during which no trains ran. Passengers were stranded aboard seven Great Western Hex and Elizabeth Line trains, and some took matters into their own hands and self-evacuated which can't have made life easy for the teams on the ground. Elizabeth Line trains have no toilets, of course, and this made matters much, much worse, with reports of passengers being forced to urinate in the train. At least 3,100 passengers were evacuated to Old Oak Common, North Pole and Hanwell, a major exercise in itself, so a hat tip to the frontline teams who handle that very tricky job. Network Rail will carry out a review and the sensible thing to do is await the outcome of that so we can discuss facts, not speculation, specifically about cause. However, there is every reason why we should, and actually we believe must, discuss management reaction, or lack of it, because as in previous incidents, poor communication and a seeming lack of quick decision-making expose several fault lines. Transport for London blamed Network Rail and other train operators in a sad display of finger-pointing, as left blamed GWR for allowing a manager, allegedly, who was fully qualified and competent to drive for causing the mess in the first place, um, presumably trying to imply that had a member of Aslef been driving, it wouldn't have happened. Eventually, it transpired that the driver was blameless. No one seemed to really take charge, or if they did, it wasn't very apparent. Network Rail Chief Executive Andrew Haynes was actually on one of the trains caught up in the incident himself. He has not prevaricated and was brave enough, and he was brave, to say this within hours on LinkedIn. We failed as a system. Too many individual actors seeing risk from their own perspective meant it was harder than it should have been to get things done whilst maintaining safety. Multiple self-evacuations because of the pace at which we were able to move or even access trains cannot be regarded as good safety practice. We've gone backwards on customer service. Tools to look after passengers that I would have used as a station manager in 1987 before I'd even seen a mobile phone were not available and we were hardly great at it then. We can do better than we did last night when we take customers' legitimate concerns seriously. Blimey, when the chief executive of Network Rail is being so openly, promptly, and yes, excoriatingly self-critical, we've got a serious problem, haven't we, Richard? We do. And you know that, that comment that he made there about too many individual actors seeing risk from their own perspective is, I think, it's especially troubling. Um, 
I believe he's right, by the way. Yes, um, me too. Uh, and I'm, I'm clear that this demands, I think it demands an urgent rethink about what we do next, because somebody somewhere's seriously got, got to get a grip. This isn't the only uh, incident, uh, you know, the only kind of problem we've had over the last few years. We've had multiple dewirements in other parts of the network and so on and so forth. I'm actually certain now um, that we do not need a guiding mind um, to provide clarity and coherence to the railways, but actually in a slight, I think a slightly detached way as has been envisaged perhaps even by Great British Railway. I, I think it's time to forget that. I, I think certainly GBR and Great British Railways in the form that it's currently envisaged, is actually time to be bold and brave. And we've got to get back to some basics fast whilst we still have a chance, right? And we've talked about this a few weeks ago. We have. So forgive me for mixing a <laughs> few metaphors here, Nigel, but my view is we need a directing mind um, to stick a few well-aimed boots up a few well-targeted arses, frankly. If this isn't sorted soon, um, there's gonna, there isn't going to be a viable passenger-friendly industry really um, left to have a future. Well, there's no beating about the bush there, Richard, and I have to say I agree with all of that. And it's worth pointing out something else that Andrew said in his LinkedIn post. He said, I witnessed firsthand some outstanding colleagues from across the railway family busting a gut to do the right thing. It was a privilege and humbling to work alongside them. You know who you are. Thank you. So Andrew clearly identifies the problem. So it suggests that had he been the direct in mind that night, then the outcome might have been a bit more positive and clear in terms of acting quickly rather than spending hours in discussion about what to do. Yeah, and I thought that comment was was real leadership. I mean, supporting and thanking the people on the ground who clearly did a fantastic job in, in very difficult circumstances. He was spot on. So there were some amazing people doing some amazing things. Um, but I, without prejudging anything, and we genuinely aren't, um, I'd be surprised if um, the failure to get things sorted faster than we did was kind of down to a, anything more complicated, really, than a lack of, lack of joined-up management and control. And if anybody listening to this from the railway sort of says that the necessary protocols and procedures were in place uh, on Thursday night, then I'm telling you that they're crap and they need rethinking because... Um, what we saw on Thursday night last week was not um, was not uh, great at all, because in the end, passengers will just not put up with things uh, like that, and they'll if they're casual users, they won't come back, you know, and that is a real concern. Nor should they put up with it. We had an incident a few years ago at Lewisham. Uh, where exactly this happened, where some trains stopped within sight of the platform ends. And after four hours, people were getting out onto the live rails and it it stopped half of London because of it. Um, there is clearly a tipping point where people will be patient until they can see something happening. And we're obviously going beyond it. And I think personally, I agree with everything you said, but that comment um, um, Andrew made about too many actors seeing risk from their own viewpoint goes absolutely to the heart of it. Um, and then goes up. That is directly connected to your point about directing mind. At some point, somebody needs to say, "Right, well, enough of that. You do this. You do that. You do that." Yeah, um, we are. We're there now. We're there now. Know, in my view. We, we are at that point. Absolutely. Oh dear. Well, Richard was fairly clear there, and I think we've all been pretty clear. Let us know what you think. Do you agree? Is it time to change tack and put a more directive command and control system in place? Certainly, in circumstances like that. And what implications would that have? It's certainly tricky. We're not hiding that. But actually, do we have a viable choice? Do let us know what you think. Moving on to lighter things, there's still still time to submit some questions for our Christmas special next week. So please do let us have those by mailing us at info at greensignals.org. Thanks so much for listening again, as usual, to what we think has been, been a great show. And well done, Richard, on his first outside assignment. There'll be, there'll be many more, I'm sure. Hope you've enjoyed the show, and we'll see you next week when Richard has promised to be a bit more festive. I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. For now, it's bye from me, and... It's goodbye from me. Mm -hmm.